Okay, everybody, my name is Andrew Tompkins, and I'm the director of the Finley Lakes Boating Museum. Once again, we're very proud to have Mike O'Brien here to discuss some of the Penyan subsidiaries, Angler Boats, and Duratech. Very interesting stuff. Uh, Mike's done a lot of uh, lectures for us on um, Brumman, Penyan in World War II, Odenbach Boats, a bunch of other ones. That's his passion. So we're very proud to have Mike O'Brien back. Thank you, Mike. Thanks a lot. Well, good evening. Good evening. I'm glad to see there's a few people here. So, um, Penny and had owned two different boat companies at one point in time, and uh, the they were I don't want to say they were short lived. Angler was around for about ten years, and uh, Duratech was was even less than that. And so they created a uh, a fun sort of side event outside of Penny and Penny and made a lot of boats. They made a lot of boats in different styles and types and construction over a long period of time. And I, it's my personally, it's my favorite boat company because of that. But these two other little subsidiaries never got a whole lot of action, so I thought I might try to do a little talk on, on that more specifically. So first we're going to start off with Angler, if this will just do its thing. Oh, no. hold on a minute. Take a little bit. There we go. Okay, Angler Boat Company. Started in 1951, ran 62, 63. Essentially, we have financial records that sort of have um, various bits of financial information in there, and uh, while it's hard to interpret a lot of the information, it does have occasional nuggets that are very helpful to try to understand what's going on. So, Angler Boat Company was in the original boat factory that, that Penn Hen had built after the fire in the 20s and uh, over right by the outlet. They usually refer to it as a Liberty Street plant. So, it was originally established to sell boats for Sears and Roebuck under the Elgin name. And so what would happen is Sears and Roebuck has, it w was profusely good at advertising and selling things all over the place. But it doesn't pay to build a boat in Florida and ship it to Wisconsin. So Sears and Roebuck, eventually um, Montgomery and Ward, would essentially hire regional distributors to build similar type boats. Those boats would then be sold on a regional basis. And that's kind of how this whole process got started. So. The um, eventual, and so the financials show that in this essentially started in 1951, and how I know it wasn't all of them at that point is because they had accounts receivable, but they only had accounts receivable from 1951 to 52 for Sears and Roebuck. And then the following years, from 53 forward is where they picked up for Montgomery Ward. Um, they did, uh, they made manufactured boats for Firestone for, for one year. There's accounts receivable just for the 53, 54 year. The original, say, vice president of the Angler Boat Company was Joseph Collier. He was born in England. Um, he ran a garage in Ovid and eventually went to work for someone else in another garage. Um, he was a foreman of the Arcadia Trailer um, Company in Newark, he was superintendent associated car craft of Syracuse, manager of the Hercules Campbell uh, Company in Waterloo, superintendent of Penny and Bus Bodies, which kind of came and went. Um, if we get ourselves through into the 40s, superintendent of cabinetry at Walker Belt, he eventually became the manager for the inboard division of Penny and Boats. So this is one of these guys that is engineer-minded, um, coordinating, thinks about stuff in a, in a fashion, about efficiency. Uh, and then in, in 1951, he became, um, they moved him over and became vice president of, of Angler Boats. So unfortunately, at the age of 62 in 1953, he passed away. It was kind of a sudden surprise. So that brings up Howard Frum, and uh, Keith Frum is here, and he was helpful for me gaining a couple of images. I, I stole that one off the internet, Keith, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> uh, of his dad. So um, how, did he go by Howard, or did he have another name went by? Howard. Just Howard? So Howard essentially uh, was responsible for kind of operating Angler. Now, when you say that you're responsible, we didn't have in-time... Um, management of resources and inventory back then like we did today and so so things were much more much more challenging he was born in uh, Jeanette PA uh, he was an engineer for Elliott company in that town uh, he became chief warrant officer in World War II uh, he worked for Halloway which anybody that knows that knows they went on to become Xerox um, Ward Company in Ohio he came back to S Sylvania Lighting um, and after Angler uh, he came in Keith and I are, are, are guessing that he was not there necessarily to the entire end, but 61, 62 was kind of a good guess on Keith's part as to when he decided to move on. And when he did, he uh, bought into uh, Cucalumber Company. 
Uh, he was a past president of the Kiwanis. He was a recipient of the Silver Beaver. As a, as a former Boy Scout myself, I understand the importance and the honor that that is. And that um, essentially his maternal grandmother, do I have that right, Keith? His, his mom? No. <clears throat> My mother's mother was your mother's mother was from Cuba Park. All right, so his mother's mother was from Cuba Park. I made a mistake on that, and so there's the uh, that's kind of how the the this area uh, materialized for him. Uh, he had a reputation for working well with other people. He was very interested in, in um, efficiency of things. Enjoyed um, managing processes, or at least that seems to be the way things were. And apparently, he had a good sense of humor. And I don't know if I should tell that story about. Uh, or Stewart or not, <laughs> um, and it's funny. I, and another time we'll bring that up because because Bob Stewart had an interesting reputation. But so at any rate, um, he essentially saw uh, most of the uh, activity for for Angler. Now Angler boats mostly, like I said, made things for other companies. But if you went to Angler and you decided you wanted to buy a boat, you could get one right off the floor. Um, and as such, they had occasional advertisements. This really would have been much more local. They weren't trying to necessarily sell these things all over the place. But for that one year, I was only ever able to find an example of one advertisement, and it just happened to be an advertisement that was in the local Pena newspaper as to them selling, selling boats for Firestone. Now, these particular boats, I've had one of these. I've actually had two. They were a disaster. And not the boat as such, but the boats I bought were a disaster. They were a mess. And I got them because I knew what they were, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about them. And so they essentially were of strip pipe construction, which essentially means you have an outer layer of planking, you have an inner layer of planking, both were cedar, and then Penyan had a thin layer of plastic that went in there. Now, this was great when it was new, but essentially they were a nailed boat. And so what would happen is, is the boat would flex in the water and you would have expansion and contraction with wood over the years. Eventually the hole that permeated that plastic would start to form a little bit of an ellipse. And this is a major problem with all of their strip tight construction because they made boats that were 19 foot long, which is way too big for Penyan did anyways, which is way too big for this kind of construction. So what would happen is, sooner or later the boat would start to leak. And there was absolutely no way to fix the leak. You either fiberglass the whole outside of the boat, which made it weigh 10,000 pounds, or you got another boat. And so, um, but this was a very good, quick, dry, when it was new kind of construction. But as the boats would age, they just didn't age that well. So uh, in the late 50s, they got into making a uh, lap strake for both Montgomery and Ward and Sears. This is the 1960 Sears catalog uh, page that I found. Um, there are, uh, the specifications for the boats were determined by, say, Sears and Roebuck or Montgomery and Ward, and then they were kind of negotiated back and forth. So this is not the knockoff version of uh, like a Penyan, Niagara, or Baltic. They were a completely different boat. The lines on them are very different. The way the tumble home and the transom is is very different. They, they don't have a lot in common. Um, but uh, as I'll get into in a little bit, um, they were uh, more cost effective. So this is, this is the 59 um, Montgomery Ward uh, boat catalog with, with the two boats down, with those two down there. Um, and I've, I've tried very hard to find other examples, and, and I don't know, I got 10 years into goofing around with this thing on a part-time basis. This is the best I've ever been able to come up with. But I guarantee you, next week, I will find a catalog on eBay that I've never seen before, because that's exactly what happens. So the, this was part of a, a bigger page, and I, I grabbed this because in 63, this was a supplemental insert in the Penny and Bill catalogs. So this was the end of inventory. And they were trying to pass these things, pass them out, get them out of there, get them out of the inventory. And so I grabbed this in part because down here it says Angler model, it's got KS62365. And it sort of gives it some of the specifics to it, what it can carry and so on and so forth. Um, this happens to be sort of the model for this boat, a lap strake, an Angler lap strake, I'm, I'm, this is a little guesswork. 62, I really think, is the year. Um, I have this boat, this same boat, KS59328, 
I think mine is a 59. I know the museum has one. I don't know. I, I have the, the impression the one the museum has, they might have taken the, the transom and shortened it a little bit. I don't know if you know that off the top of your head. or. But uh, I haven't seen the boat physically in a, in a very long time. But um, So when you're looking for... When you look at a boat and you think it's and you think it might be an angler, because it's not marked, because when Penny Ann was selling these after after angler production wound down, they just put the Penny Ann uh, logo on the side of it. So if you find a Penny Ann that doesn't look quite right, something about it is a little off, and you go back right about where the capacity um, marquee is, and you're looking at a KS, then that that's going to be that's going to be an angler boat. That's an old angler production boat. Um, so things that differentiated what, what uh, Angler was doing versus what Penny Ann did. Penny Ann had this, this anti-fungal soda they would put in the bilge and allow it to sink in and they would drain it out. Angler wasn't necessarily doing that with their lap straight boats. Um, this was one that was for sale. Mine doesn't look anywhere as close as this, but uh, things that also kind of differentiated it. Penny Ann had a tendency when they built their seats that there was a molded spring on it so when you would lean back in the seat it would bounce a little bit the seat back these were much more rigid um, they tended to have straighter cuts when they did things versus having rounded cuts to sort of uh, and accentuate the lines of how the boats were built um, you s the the guard along the gunnel um, Penny Ann production boats had a tendency to have like a rolled stainless steel strip so, such that underneath the curve was a small, you know, space. Uh, Angler had a much skinnier, um, thinner uh, bumpers on it. They were nailed. This is aluminum, the solid piece. The uh, Penny Ann had a tendency to, to make their decks a little fancier with some lines in it, even, even later after this was out, so that uh, uh, a, a, the Angler lap strake is a much simpler boat. Um, up here you have what are two holes. They would have been filled with putty. Penny Ann production boats would have had an actual wood bung in there, would have been sanded and would have been finished. Um, where's the one with the windshield? This here, they tended to, Angler tended to have um, hardware and fasteners that were visible instead of buried. This would have been obviously a lot easier, it would have been faster to put together. The hardware, this is, this is a, a bracket for the top bows for the, for the convertible top. Um, whereas you would have had a probably silicon bronze bracket that was chrome plated that would have been on a standard pennion boat. Angler had much simpler hardware. And so if you're looking at something, you're not sure it's an angler, somebody's telling you it is or isn't an angler, some of the things to look for are uh, that the overall construction is a little simpler, um, that instead of uh, taking what might have been an extra step to bury a fastener, they had a tendency to put just simply putty over the thing, or they just left it, left it uh, bare. So there's one other little fun thing that they did, and they did it in one year, Angler did. They had a, a molded a hull boat. Five layers of birch, multi-directional, as we talked about this during when I gave a talk about the World War II boats, essentially the same concept. And uh, Yellow Jacket, who was partially owned by Roy Rogers, I don't know if anybody knows that, um, they uh, wanted to uh, manufacture these boats, but like everything else, they were in Texas. And so what they did is they contracted with Panyan for one year to build molded hulled boats. Now, what's kind of fun about this, all these things are, inter there's so much interconnection with some of the stuff. So um, here you have an example of what I was talking about, the thin layers of an ear. It's a big old picture of my dad's hero there, Roy Rogers. So what happened was um, these molded hulls, these were, a lot of them in the 50s were sold out of Canada. And... Um, the Industrial Shipping Company Limited in Mahone Bay. So guys like me will refer to it as a, a Mahone Bay hull. Well, what had happened is um, they had a fire in, I think, 1956, and it pretty much wiped out. They made pay ships early on. Pay ships eventually became the name change to Plycraft. But the fire um, pretty much wiped everything out, and they really didn't know uh, whether uh, Industrial Shipping Company was even going to come back to life. Um, essentially, uh, um, the guys in Texas talked the operation in Canada to move down there. Well, when they did that, now they're shipping boats from Texas 
up to New York, which didn't work. And so um, what they would do is they would basically ship up this unfinished hull, no transom, no hardware, no gunnels, no seats, no framing, nothing like that, up to Penyan, and Penyan was finishing it off. Now the boat uh, museum has one of these. It was owned by a guy named Ed Newcomb. He happened to be a, the, a foreman that operated on the floor. He had two of them. This is the story that I got when I picked up this boat. I bought this gave it to the museum. Ed had a boat on Cuca Lake, and he had one on um, Seneca Lake. And so when he decided where he wanted to go fishing, he was going to go get on, get on his angler boat and go out fishing. The, these are, uh, even now, this boat that the museum has is very well made. They were a really well made boat if they just didn't let a lot of water sit in them. So um, I bought this off a gentleman whose wife actually was the administrative secretary for, for angler at the time in the, in the uh, 50s. And so he, at the, and they, they've all passed away at this point, you know, but, but these molded hull boats, I've been told that there is one that is uh, completely original that's in Canada, where I've never, I've never been able to scare the thing up, but the one difference between an actual factory example and the one the museum has is, um, at one point it was decided that this windshield was way too low, and so the original windshield was removed and a slightly taller one was put on it. Um, the other thing about this boat that the museum has is that it was sold as an angler. It is an angler, but it, it has a um, Elgin steering wheel in it. It has the Elgin, the blue and the white Elgin cover, uh, covers on the seats. If you guys have any questions or something, or I say something that seems off, just yell it out. I got it. So that's that fly that was in the 62 Pinion boat catalog that sort of talked about um, these two particular craft as being you know, excess, what I call ex excess inventory. So, um, Angler was the first uh, boat company in Steuben County to manufacture a fiberglass boat. So I don't know how they got that honor. You would have thought they would have done that over the Penyon factory, but since it's all the same family, who knows? Um, but what I really think is interesting about this is they first started off with a dinghy. And Keith was telling me that apparently they had one uh, of those molded uh, fiberglass boats that came out of the mold wrong and it ended up becoming his sandbox. Was it a, do you know, do you remember, was it, was it, was it a dinghy, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was one of the, f the first ones of screwing around trying to figure out out. These are uh, cop quick images of some of the financials that we have in the, in the library. And what I think is extremely cool about this, because it, I've never seen one, is that under this 1962, year ending 1962, clinker boats, they manufactured $4,200 worth of that stuff. Fiberglass boats, they made $15,000 worth. And uh, 61, clinker was 35,000, fiberglass was almost $200,000. So there's $191,402.58 worth of fiberglass angler boats out there, and I have never seen one. I've never even heard of one. Seen one. Yeah, you have? It's a later one from yeah. the late 80s. It was a center console fiberglass outboard. No kidding. So I just, I, I've never seen pictures, I've never seen advertisements, maybe it was just so late in the process they just, I don't know, who knows, maybe they decided we'll make uh, three, four, five hundred of these things and we'll call them anglers and if they don't work out then we'll blame it on angler and we'll <laughs> manufacture them someplace else. But even by 63, you know, you can see clinker construction, 350 bucks, fiberglass boats, 470. I mean, at, at that point, by, by, by the August of 63, they're, they're, not, man, they're not making boats anymore, they're just trying to trying to push stuff out. But that really floored me when I saw this 1961 piece and there's like, you know, just out of 255,000 in sales, 191 is, is fiberglass bolt. I'm into money, so I find this stuff very interesting. That's where I get to this. So, because I'm into money, I have to talk about this. So we're lucky enough to have, to have this stuff. So what I did is essentially I took each year, year end, so this would have been the 1951 year, so to speak, running through into 52, because their year ended at the end of August. And so this is their net sales, 90,000, 250,000, 380,000, 380,000, 423,000, that's the high water mark in 1956, 394, 312, 269, 270, 254, and then in 62, the handwriting is on the wall, and we dropped down to 16000 By 1963, we did $180 worth of sales. So I, I also did things like what they sold, what the cost was to build it. And I, my, the fun part for me on this is that in 52, essentially, they made, and this is oversimplified. There's other adjustments that are made to this, but I thought this was really neat. 
1952, Angler made about 9,500 bucks. Um, in 53, they made about $28,000. They made $29,000 in 55. In 1956, they made about $68,000. In 1960, they made, uh, or not 60, in 1956, they made $60,000. In 57, they made $35,000. And then we start running in the red. Now, it would be interesting for me to figure that out because 1958, 59, 60, 61, 62, these are all years where things kind of drop, drop off. 59 and 60, these are uh, similar years where there's just, where there's just no profit. But then, um, probably through competent management, uh, the last two years, 60-61, um, losses are, are, are far lower than you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of loss. To a point where by the time we're into 1963, uh, losses at, at, at Angler were like 2900 bucks. So, depending on what number you want to look at in the financial information I've come, I've come across with this, uh, there's a couple different ways to interpret it, but I'll just say, Profits from operation over the lifetime of Angler were probably close to about uh, $90, $96,000. So that's okay because that's excess. That's after paying the employees. That's after the insurance. That's after utilities. That's after everything else. And so, uh, you know, I, I'd say that this turned out to be a pretty worthwhile experience for Penny and its employees and, and all the other ones that were involved in it. Any questions? Move on, Mike. All right, so now we get to... Duratec. So this was Penny Ann's attempt to, to, to drop themselves into the aluminum bow business. So at this point, the folklore on this is that the New York Boat Show, and I, there, I have never been able to substantiate this, and to be honest with you, if it wasn't for the fact that it's in the back of my mind, I, I couldn't even tell you necessarily who told me this. I was told that um, Roy Moss and, uh, uh, what was Sheeflin's first name? Do you remember? The owner of Penny Ann had met at the New York Boat Show in the first part of 1964. Penny Ann approached uh, Moss and said, geez, we're thinking about getting into the aluminum boat business. You guys interested in doing something? Well, that something turned into uh, an eventual merger um, in, in July of 64. So he's another one of these guys, um, Roy Moss was, that was some kind of an engineer. He had a degree in aeronautical engineering. Um, always thinking about problems. If we think about Pen Yan and who started Pen Yan, if you think about a lot of other people that built manufactured boats, we always seem to grumman, we always seem to end up back in aeronautical engineering. So uh, he, during the Second World War, he designed wings and wing tips for B-24s and B-26s. Uh, and then he just constantly was coming up with all kinds of unusual things. I, I have heard the explanation to this. I do not, anybody ski here, I don't know what a ski tow rope gripper is. But apparently this was a fairly novel invention that got some traction, and he actually was able to make a business out of selling them things. He also designed farm equipment um, for a, a company. They designed acoustical panels that were used by the Marine Corps for out in front of the White House that, according to the article I got that from, um, are still in use, or at least they're, they're, they're uh, replacements. And the Dory Development Company used to make and manufacture removable fiberglass tops for Mustangs and uh, Corvairs. And then even after Duratec, he was still involved in manufacturing and doing all kinds of little things. He was in the 70s during the, 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 the National um, Centennial, he was manufacturing like reproductions of antique coins and all kinds of things that, that I just, I don't know, he was, this guy's mind from what I could tell was constantly moving and thinking and, and, and going on and on and on. But he's best known for getting involved in Duratec. And over his tenure from 50 to 64, they, they produced about 50,000 boats. Now, this whole thing got started because he was trying to get a um, car topper on his vehicle in 1948, and he ended up hurting his back. And while he was trying to recover from that, he got thinking, just like everyone else got thinking, how do we make this lighter? How do we not have... A canoe that will, you know is supposed to be 70 pounds that weighs 124 because it's waterlogged. And so he came up with um, these little prams. So by 1950, he's making these little prams out of his mother's garage. And it went from that into a sailing pram. That evolves eventually into things like um, sailboats, 
different kinds of V-hulls, outboards, fishing boats. You know, you start making a 9-foot boat, then you start making a 12-foot boat. Well, if you can make a 12-foot boat, you can make a 14-foot boat. And if you can do that, you can make a 16-foot boat. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember the advertisement that we had for, like, uh, for Grumman from, I think it was 1948, had a very similar image of a woman holding a 13-foot canoe over her head because it was, it was 50 pounds. So that seems to be the, the, the big thing. Uh, for sales for them was that it was 48 pounds, and that and that um, even even a mere female can get it on top of a car. <laughs> so, and as as the product line increased, the different kinds of boats started to increase, and then eventually in '56, if you notice, there's colors on those. In '56, they started to produce something called Duradeck. Now, this was a laminated uh, sheet that was placed down over the top of um, a boat deck was heated to get it to adhere to it, and it created essentially um, a, a non-skid surface that um, uh, was supposed to be impervious to salt water and, and all sorts of other things. This was apparently a pretty good product, and it, it served the life of the, of the company even after it was sold to uh, Penny Ann. For a very brief period of time in the late 50s, uh, from 59 to 61, Duratech got into a franchise with um, Glass Magic to build fiberglass boats. Essentially, it was the same argument. We want to make fiberglass boats. It doesn't. It's not cost effective for us to ship them from five states away. Do you want to do it? That went great until there was a big fire in 1961, and then they got out of the plastic boat business. Uh, at its peak, uh, Duratech in 1960 had uh, 20 different models. Even under Penny Ann, I think the most Penny Ann ever had when they were manufacturing the boats was 19. So this is really cool, because, so, anybody remember the Bay of Pigs invasion? All right, so, um, this is a photograph that was in the New York Times. The, these, are, these are all uh, Cuban, Cuban nationals, and so essentially the short version is, for those that may not know this, there were a bunch of individuals that had found their way to Florida that decided that they really didn't want Castro there, and so they coordinated with what was essentially the CIA to try to invade Cuba, they wanted to sort of bump off a few people at the right point in time and then get the locals to help up and try to throw out Castro and the rest of his buddies. It didn't work. Um, it didn't work at all. It was effectively a horrible disaster. So the, the word on the street is that um, Roy Moss saw this picture and recognized that boat as being one of his. So he had a contract, and I don't know the total number, but he was told that these boats were being manufactured uh, for, uh, what was it again, um, use by uh, 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 workers on oil rigs offshore, and that they were going to buy a whole series of these things. Well, they, that wasn't the case at all. It ended up being the CIA wanted to use these things for landing crafts. So um, the problem was that the timing of the events that morning just didn't allow for this to work out. The tide was in the wrong place. And so they, they went, activity on shore started happening too early. And so they had, to, they had to launch these boats off bigger boats on shore. And when they did, they ended up hitting the shoal or, and, and, and uh, poking big holes in them. So what was happening is these boats, you, were guaranteed, you, were, you, you, you had a, uh, a lifetime puncture guarantee by Roy Moss. And I hope as a taxpayer that the CIA was able to capitalize on it. <laughs> Because um, essentially what happened is the, the water was just too low and a lot of these boats ended up just getting the snot beat out of them in the process of trying to land. Um, and if, if effectively, if they just weren't able to, they were able to get guys on shore, but then they couldn't get guns and ammunition on shore. So now you got people running around with clubs trying to take out guys that have a much bigger arrangement. The other thing that, uh, you know, this is all cheap history. Theoretically, the United States was supposed to supply air cover. Um, that never showed up. And without air cover, uh, history has taught us that invading a country is kind of hard. So, but this is a, and I can't, I, I thought, yeah, sorry. So this distance is 12 miles. That's an 18-foot boat. Do you want to go 12 miles <laughs> in a Duratec 18-foot boat? I don't think I would. But, um, and so just because it's fun, they decided uh, that the uh, Cuban government decided to keep one of these Duratec boats and place it in their museum down there on display in the Revolutionary in the Revolution Museum. And so this is still on display down in Cuba. That's another picture of them. That's that's the factory uh, version of 
of what the CIA what the CIA took. They essentially stripped it, no windshield, no seats, and just well, there was a seat in there, but it was one seat by the steering wheel, so they could just load them up with stuff. So eventually, we get around to the mid 1964. Um, where Bob Stewart, President of Penn Yen Boats, and Roy Moss, President of Duratech Manufacturing, have decided on a merger agreement that is going to be effective after July 31st, 1964. Um, effectively moving um, Duratech from Peekskill to Penn Yen, New York. Um, by 1965, yeah, this is January 8th. This is an advertisement in um, motor boating. Uh, for a Penn Yen built Duratech boat. So in the, in the, from, the, from July through December and the early parts of, of 65, they moved a ton of stuff over, as a matter of fact, Red Pressure, who, who was a, a long-time um, museum volunteer here many years back, uh, worked there for part of that winter. And um, he's always, his, his memory is interesting to me because it has much more to do with the functionality of the day-to-day -day and you had uh, essentially at the time they they needed people to come in and make boats. Well, Red's a farm boy, you know, but he knows which end of the hammer is the handle, and so he got hired. <laughs> so there are three images that I have of uh, manufacturing of Duratech boats in the in the Penyan factory, and uh, I think it's worth noting that you have one guy with a drill. Granted, it's it's an air-operated pneumatic. But if you can tell, I don't know how easy you can see that, there are a lot of holes that man is drilling with that one drill. So I would love to know how long it took him to drill all those holes and then have someone put the rivets in it so that they could manufacture this thing. I love this, these prams in the background. This is good stuff. So this is a jig. It's a little hard to decipher unless you can really see it, but essentially what they've got is this is this jig helps set up the form. These cross members are good because you're you're dealing with flat pieces of aluminum. You got to stick it in there. You got to hold it in place. You got to drill your holes and you got to put it together. It's not like when Grumman made a canoe where they just put it on a form, sort of bent it over, popped out two sides, and riveted it together. To me, I mean, a wood boat is a lot of labor, but this is also a lot of labor. And I remember reading uh, some commentary from someone years ago that worked, I think, for Penny Ann in either '65 or '66. That time period. And in 65 and 66, you were still making wood boats, you were making big wood boats, you were making fiberglass boats, and now you're making aluminum boats. And the commentary about that period in time was that it was absolute chaos in the factory because you had all these different things going on. They all required very different skill sets to properly operate. And so um, that chaos comment really always kind of stuck with me. So another mildly noteworthy item is that um, if you, this is hard to tell, um, the spray rail in this boat is split and it overlaps. That was really a Duratech thing. As time went on, Penny got rid of that. And they got rid of it pretty quick. Probably somebody came along and said, why are we using more material to overlap that? And why are we drilling... I don't know, 15% more holes in this boat so we can, we can give it that look. That, that's a guess. But, and the other thing that is noteworthy too is these are smooth-sided hulls. So, um, as, as you will see in a minute, Penny Ann decided that there was a better way. I don't know if it was a better way, but they decided it was a better way. So, I was able to get a hold of a 1966 color catalog from, from when Penny Ann was manufacturing these boats, and it was a, a fun part of looking at what Roy Moss had the basic structures of, and concepts of how he built boats didn't really change that much. Some of the models did, but essentially, uh, Penny Ann made some things that really made them visually look quite different. As Penny Ann brought them in and kind of made them their own. So 1965, essentially their first full year of production, that was where their peak number of, of, of boats that they had uh, to build was 19 in 1965. So this is the front cover. First dead giveaway that we're dealing with at Penny Ann Duratech is it's got this sort of faux lap straight look. Uh, Duratech didn't make boats like that uh, prior to Penny Ann. Notice that, that it still has that, uh, that Dura deck covering on it. And if I had to guess, I would say that's a Penny Ann Owasco canoe in the background. Um, the other thing that's noteworthy is that 
this particular emblem that's on the side of that was a plastic sort of three-dimensional piece that you would rivet onto it. That would evolve. I've never been able to get good pictures of this stuff, even though I've been goofing around on Facebook Marketplace and before that Craigslist and <laughs> trying to get these. So uh, anybody that can get this, I will give them a $500 cash reward just for locating a Penyan Duratec aluminum canoe. Uh, if you notice, one of the, now th they moved away from those plastic emblems and went to a sticker. In, in uh, uh, several that I have personally seen when I didn't have a camera with me, and this is predate cell phones, they were black and white, and eventually they went to um, silver with black, and because it was essentially um, two, what's supposed to be like two seagulls flying, one's black and the other one's red. That's another indication you're dealing with a, a penny and boat, and it's a, a late season boat. So this K7, this this is K was their canoe. Why didn't you see is beyond me. Uh, seven would have been 17 foot. Uh, just like pram, P, pram, nine, nine foot. And then SP9, sailing pram, nine foot. Not very creative, but uh, nonetheless, um, still fun. Car top, C2, stands for Mr. Taylor. What do you think? Car top, 12. There he is, that's it. Anybody can do this. So then you get into V hulls, same concept, 12 footers, 14 footers. And notice, notice the, the colored adhesive sticker on here versus that three-dimensional piece. Um, they had a sea liner series. It's interesting that he has a gun in his hand. <laughs> we don't know what's going on there. Uh, there's, I, I've often thought about this. This is the only, I, I still don't get that. I, I don't know when the pictures were done for that, but eventually Penyan just didn't have those um, uh, split spray rails. Once again, see, solid spray rail. Uh, this one still has that little three-dimensional plastic um, emblem on the back of it. Um, these were the sporty boats. These are your go-go boats. Uh, this was the sport boat. So the sports boat and the, uh, the uh, Galaxy um, saved, uh, shared the same hull. Uh, very few of these were made. I just don't know if they were not popular, sort of the pre predecessor to the bass boat. Um, that's a, going back, uh, the photo of Penyon Aeronautical. Oh yeah. Do you know? Do you know the context of that? I have no idea why you would park a boat in front of an airplane hangar. I don't know if I don't know. I haven't got a clue. Or maybe it was just. I don't know. I don't get it. Uh, Anyone's welcome to educate me. Is that is that hangar still up there? Yeah. Yeah. Go go back a couple slides if you would. Sure. Where? One more, right there. Yeah, that's the one I got, a Sea Line 16. Yeah, the one on the right? Yeah. Is that the one you said you kind of hustle around stuff with? More or less, yeah. I mean, but that's that's the one. Do you, what kind of badge do you have on the on the back by the transom? Do you know? Is it is it plastic? Because the plastic ones tended to break and fall off too, you know, age and size. I I'd have to look at it, but it has that emblem on the sides. The seats are that way. It's smooth sided like that without any ribs yeah. on the inside. But that that's the one. Cool. Once again, the Orion, 17 foot, got that seven. Here's, here's the, uh, the Galaxy. This was the same hull as the sport boat with a different deck on it. Um, and there's your little cruiser. And so uh, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that gas station wasn't still in Penya. But uh, so this was uh, the CG8 Galaxy Cruiser 18 foot. Right, big shocker. And I, I think it's neat that we have an all aluminum boat and somebody had to put a mahogany dashboard on. And then they essentially, if you can make an outboard, you can make an I.O. And so then they started to manufacture. And these are lovely brochures. These are certainly, I don't want to say it's certainly nicer, but the brochures that Penny Ann put out about the, the Duratec line were much more flattering than, than the predecessor was. A lot of those brochures tended to be two color, three color. Uh, Penny Ann, I think, was, was really throwing some money behind this thing when they were in the midst of doing it. Because... I just think the timing was off. I'd love to do a study about um, from 1960 to like 1980 uh, because 
I remember from looking up um, when we when we had a talk about Grumman that the larger aluminum boats just completely disappeared from the Grumman lineup by the mid '60s and were replaced by a lot of sort of smaller 14s, 12s. I don't think the economy was was all that terrible in the mid '60s. I don't really know what it caused that, but it's it sort of by looking at some other companies that made aluminum boats, it just partially feel that you have aluminum boats being manufactured by Penny in an environment where, where maybe fiberglass was really taking over and it just wasn't getting just wasn't getting the traction that, that um, they were hoping for. So I'd love to find one of them too. But uh, and, and and these things well, I've I've never seen a Penny in one that, that's like this that has that that full lap straight hull on it with the with the with the the solid spring rail. I just I, I we have production records, um, but they I'm going to show them to you in a minute. And I and boy, if we just had one more year, I'd know so much more about what they were doing. But what are you going to do? Stern drive options very common. This was a you know available in Penny um, A couple of fun little shots of construction and how rigid they are. And the high quality boat that you're going to get when you buy it. Uh, and a uh, wonderful image of the uh, Penny and factory, which. When did they tear that down? Three years ago? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, just for the fun of it, I threw two slides on here. So this is 65, 66, 67. Uh, I did this because you can kind of tell that, geez, there's some, there's some boats here. It looks like there's a few less boats here. There's definitely less boats by the time we get down here. And uh, then we get to 68 and 69. So uh, these were available models, prices, and uh, and we'll we'll this will dovetail into a ne another piece I've got here. So these are actual production records that we have. Uh, the museum's library has actual handwritten production notes from about '68 through '80, '82, something like that. There's a year or two maybe missing in there. But what's fun about this, this is January, February, March of 68, and then there's, I cut them apart because they're big sheets. But you get carry forwards. So this is supposedly the 68 production year. The carry forward from August to this point in time would have been 13 nine foot prams. So from August to 67 uh, till January uh, 1, they made 18 of the prams. Uh, they had a, a fishing boat, their car topper. This is clearly car topper, 12 foot car topper. They manufactured 100 before we got into January from August August on. But then you get into, uh, they had a 14 foot meteor. That was pretty popular. That was an outboard. That was 30 boats. But these are not, we're not manufacturing thousands of boats here. It's at least not by 68. Um, these, so this is sort of the beginning of the year with the different models on it. And I sort of lined it up like this because this is, so this is first quarter, this is end of second quarter, <coughs> and then you get into, um, uh, it's, the numbers are hard to read, you get into like the, four, you know, now you're getting into mid-year, and so even by um, the middle of 1968, the carryover from the prior year to that, you're looking at 14 boats, 146 boats, and that's, that's a, you know, 12-foot fisherman, 100 uh, boats, which is the car topper, 34, 27, 19, 11, 30, 24, 10, 29, 2, uh, from August of 67 to June of 68, they they manufactured 446 Duratec boats, which is not uh, land office business, I don't think. So we move into the first part of 69, and um, I sort of chopped this up because this is this is all that was going on. So once again, this 12-foot fisherman is still pretty popular. This, uh, or, um, um, there's a 14-foot fisherman, 34, 26. Uh, I don't know what happened with that sailing pram, if it's got smashed or what, but I thought it was funny that it was negative with a circle around it. And then you get, like, nothing. And then suddenly in April, and you get uh, two more of the, these 12-foot, 12 12-footers. 12 and then that's it. And so probably what happened is, um, if you look at, if you look further into the production records, you have like built and trimmed, and I don't know why there was a transition where they went from like full boats to I think what sounds and feels like they manufactured hulls and then they stacked them, and when they needed to sell one, they grabbed something off the stack 
they trim the thing out with the rails on it and whatever deck mount, and then it would go out the door. So they didn't have to. I, I, I it, it was a. I found it a little harder to keep ha my hands on, but I'm interpreting someone else's information. So just for the fun of it, these are also more records that we happen to have. So year end September 30th, 1965. I threw this in here because I really think it's cool. This tells us wood boats, inboard wood boats in 1965, because we're approaching the end. 1966, that was it. Penyan was done at that point. We were in full on, full on plastic boats at that point with a little bit of aluminum boat action going on. Inboards wood 454,000, outboards 204. Fiberglass, 648,000 dollars worth. Inboards 245,000 dollars worth. Aluminum, 23,000 dollars worth. Outboards 390,000. That's 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 a good chunk. I mean, when you're talking about um, the other line of boats, geez, these guys must have felt like, boy, we really nailed it with these aluminum boats. We're selling four hundred thousand dollars worth of aluminum boats up against, say, say eight hundred thousand dollars and and you know six hundred thousand dollars. That that's all right. That's a good compliment. The problem is it just didn't work out. So, bump my clicker. So you have gross sales, operating loss, 1965, year end, 97,000. I can't nail this down for sure, but it really looks like they probably paid Roy Moss 250 to $270,000 for this boat company because of where they're beginning certain elements of depreciation. And so that, that's a big, that's a probably an expected smack. When you look at the financial records, there's a lot of commentary in there about transferring materials, paying people to truck supplies, and getting things from point A to point B. But it didn't get better. So the year in 1966, obviously much better, $6,800 loss. And then finally, 1967, we made 5300 bucks. Uh, then in 68, we made $14,000. Um, but when it gets right down to it, uh, essentially, you know, for all the for all of the time period that was in there, the losses were were pretty significant. It just doesn't look like now. This is you know, throwing in soup the nuts. But if you're talking about stepping into an aluminum boat line costing you a couple hundred thousand dollars, and then you're dropping an, another hundred thousand dollars in, in loss of operations to start with, and your actual cash flow from operations is um, you know, a positive number of twenty thousand dollars. That's that's uh, that's probably not something you want to continue doing. I, Tony Pazenti a long time ago had uh, said in mixed company that um, uh, Duratech just didn't work out, and that's probably <laughs> probably very accurate. So, final thoughts. Uh, Duratech was a great idea for Penyan to try to have three substantial lines of boats. Um, but financially, it was a total bust. I found some indications years ago that by 69, what available equipment there was for Duratech was sold off to a couple of employees that went to, that worked for Penny, and I've never been able to find a trace of, of any of that name or otherwise since since 69. When did Duranautic come to be? That's a very good question, um, and I know that, and give me a second. So. Uh, I can look this up on my phone in a minute, but there were two employees that were part of Duratech that went off and formed Duranautic. Now, Grumman has a Duranautic boat line. I don't think it's the same thing. Because if I go and look at the history of Grumman and their Duratech or Duranautic boat line, they talk about that starting in like 1976. It seems to me that the, the two engineers that, that went off and started the Duranautic that I'm familiar with that's related to this was like 65, somewhere around the time of the split. And so um, I can actually, I don't, my phone is here someplace, I actually probably can give you a year afterwards, I just don't know off the top of my head. Angler, on the other hand, um, actually was a, was a pretty healthy investment for, for Penny and for over the years. They already owned facilities and buildings. From what I can tell, they took out a $20,000 loan against the mortgage against the original um, Liberty Street factory. 
that they already owned. Chances are that was to do upgrades to get it ready to do something. Angler had its own mill. They weren't using Penny Ann's mill. They were a fully operating, you know, entity. And so that's what I know about um, both Duratec and Angler. I hope that was of some value. Art, is there any boat manufacturing in this area at all today? Uh, some boat restores, but not a real man. I mean, Marathon. With, yeah, which is Crumman. Yeah. You know, Cortland, they're still making boats over there, but I don't know of any myself. Early exploding machine. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. So, but nothing production. Like I, at this point, most of the production companies I don't know they're downstate. They're trying to make they're trying to make boats year round. It's a lot more expense. I mean, that's what even even um, for anybody that might have listened to the Odenbach shipbuilding plant, that facility up in Rochester, they built a massive building so they could manufacture and actually launch 183 foot. Um, Army um, intercoastal tankers inside the building um, because of the Rochester winters. And so at one point they took operations down to Texas and were manufacturing down there because they didn't have anything but sun and fun down there. Didn't have to deal with keeping employees warm and this massive volume of air. The, how they used to heat that facility was these things were probably 10 foot square and 15 foot tall and they were just they operated on diesel fuel and they just belched out heat and who knows what else they, they were left in that that factory right up until it was tore down up in Greece but so any questions comments really appreciate it thank That's you good so unfortunately there's there's really limited information when you get into the actual history of these things where the majority Material we have now, the financial records. A couple of us happened to pull the right box of material off the top of some pallets that were going to be disposed of, that were soaked, and we just happened to find tax records from Penyan from 1936. In there were financial records for Duratec and Angler, um, and, and it's it's I don't know. I think the money side of it's kind of fun because you you don't have a clue. Uh, with, with companies like Chris Craft, you, you have the ability, they've retained a lot of their financial records, and you can read books, and it'll tell you kind of how the lean years and the fat years and the rest of that. But um, uh, we're, we're just lucky to have any of that. It'd be nice to publish that stuff in something more comprehensive with, with sort of industry trends and stuff, but having a few more years of production records of exactly what they were making really would have been great. But we have what we have, and so I'm glad we have what we have. So Mike, these are pretty rare to find because of the low production numbers, right? I mean, both, yeah. for both companies, really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah ang angler boats were never designed to. to they were not. Um, they were. They were a less expensive boat, mm -hmm. and so I've had a couple of. I've had a twelve foot. Um, bear with me here. I've had a 12-foot version of one of these. Um, I, I don't know what the model is. It was just a strip-type boat. But they just, um, my, my interpretation of my memory from back then is that the ribs were not as robust. Um, the finishing work in the wood wasn't quite as nice. Mm -hmm. And fit and finish wasn't quite the same. It's not to say that it wasn't a great boat. But I think um, because of because they were never they were they were they were just a they were a less ex, a less complex boat to put together. The attrition rate is a lot higher. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like these these um these molded hull boats. Uh, they just don't last if they get water in them. What happens is you get water where you get the water, you get the water either up here or you get it back by the transom. And the transom rots out, the laminate falls apart, and there's really no way to fix it. You can't put another plank on it. You can't replace the ribs. It's just a solid molded hull. There's a couple of stringers that are fastened through the bottom, through the center of it, and that's what the seats are mounted on, and then they attach to the gunnels, and that's it. And so once the transom goes, the whole boat's no good. And so one of those 12-footers that I, that I had that was a strip tight, the only reason I grabbed that is because it had a steering wheel, and in the center of the steering wheel, you probably can't see this, but... Um, In the center of the steering wheel is a thin ring, and it says angler. 
So I gave the guy a hundred bucks and told him I'd take the boat just so I could get the steering wheel, which is sitting up in my garage. Because <laughs> at some point, someone's going to have a boat or we're going to want to interpret an angler specifically, and you're never going to find a ring that says angler on it. And so this is how I accumulate that junk I have. <laughs> my wife is not listening to this, because I know my wife, so I can say things like that. How many boats do you own? Not as many as I used to. I've, I've thinned out the stuff that I, I just don't uh, see. I got one lap straight that like this, as you can tell, it's not a beauty, but it's a good solid boat. And um, they're, they're just not around. Somebody, this guy had this thing for sale, wanted to, I probably shouldn't say this out loud on the internet, Six, ten, twelve thousand dollars, and it was a reflection not because the boat was worth that kind of money. It was a reflection that this thing had been given to a boat restorer who probably charged him fifteen or twenty. And so, you know, you're trying to recoup some of that. Um, it was beautiful, and it had uh, twin uh, Evan Root outboards on it. it. Was really neat. It was a sharp looking outfit. But um, that was. Online, maybe two, three years ago, it had two. Yeah. There were twin, the big twins. Were, yeah, yeah, big the twins or ski twins. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah, it looked the color. You know, I, I love this. Is another thing. Penny had always said, like, mahogany dents. I, I love the differentiation in color. I think that really enhances the beauty. And so you throw, you got a nice lab straight boat, you throw a couple of dark blue ever roots on the back. Really looks good. I think it really So that good. had the, that's the one with the molded. Plywood transom, right? No, this is this is a, a lap strip. Okay, that's okay. it. Okay. But but I I I th this business about um, these molded boats. There's the one that I saw that I got from a, the gentleman up in Penyam, and uh, I have heard about another one. Now, uh, Mahone Bay made a boatload of these hulls, but um, to find something that was a Sea King or a Elgin or an Angler is you know, just it's, it would be hard in any any format. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, Morehouse boats also bought hulls off of off of Mahone Bay. Um, George Zeth had one. I think it was an 18 footer, but it was it suffers the same problems. If you didn't keep the thing out of the, the second the thing thing got too wet, it just disintegrated. They fell apart. Were Dunphy's the same way? Yeah, same mm -hmm. concept. Yeah. And so, and they're stronger. I mean, that's a very strong boat. It's one solid piece of wood, essentially. You put a transom on the back of that thing, you put probably a bigger boat around it than it's rated for, just go like a snap down the lake. Um, but they get a little out of sort. Even the deck is, is like a veneer component. So it's not even a function of having like a, a completely different plywood deck on there. They were, so they were, for in their day, they were a good, strong boat. Um, but they, they, the way they were made, there was no way to keep up for repairs and, and fixing it. So the attrition rate's high. Mm -hmm. A bit of useless information is uh, <clears throat> Angler kept those, but they stored them or received them, but there was a, a warehouse of, where uh, Verizon store is yeah. now in Penyon, and that's where those, those went through the process. There. Yeah, these hulls were... So they got them without a deck, without a transom. They were spooned together. They were shipped up in carloads, railroad cars, up to Penny Ann. And I, I remember reading something about how they were stored in, I don't know where the Verizon store is. I kind of always thought it was that tall building that was right next to where the bridge is. But where's the, where was the store in Verizon store it's in Penny right, right in front of that, basically. Um, it's right on the corner. Yeah. Right across from the Chinese restaurant there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think I think that's what they, I can't remember it precisely what it was. But this was, this was a... You know, talk about they didn't make a lot of these to start with because it was one year, and then on top of that, they just didn't last. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say we're lucky to have an example, just because of. I don't know how you would. I don't know what you would do to 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 grab this, but. Um, so. Any other feedback? <laughs>